What do photography, problem solving, and environmental awareness have in common? Find out as we interview Benjamin Von Wong. Hello, welcome to PhotographyTV.com, where we are designed to educate, entertain, and inspire you around photography. And today we have a tremendous opportunity to talk with Ben Von Wong, who is what I consider a creative genius when it comes to, to photography. So Ben, welcome to the show and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, Ben, I'd love to start, I always like to start with the, the backstory of how you got into photography, really what led you into this career and, and following your passion. If you could start us off with that, I, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, so photography for me um, was actually pretty much a fluke. I fell into photography by mistake when uh, a girl broke up with me. I was working in a mine in Winnemucca, Nevada as an engineer. and. Uh, uh, yeah, I had nothing better to do. So I decided why not buy a camera and take pictures of the stars. And, um, that kickstarted a whole series of events. Um, photography became a companion, a friend, something that I just w would take with me, um, everywhere, whenever I could. And, um, and, uh, it developed into this hobby slash passion that then, uh, grew to the point where, um, I realized I realized one day I didn't want to be an engineer anymore. It's not that I wanted to be a photographer. I just didn't want to be an engineer. And I didn't see myself doing it 10 years down the line. So I quit my job. And that was in 2012. And since then, I've been uh, become a photographer by default because it's the only way I really earn money. So there you go. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I was actually... Uh, I'm a fan of your Facebook page, and in your Facebook page, it says, Inspiring People to Quit Their Jobs Since 2012. Yeah. Take us through, like... <laughs> What was that feeling like leaving your job, the engineering job, which I'm sure had some security to it, to pursuing this? Take us through kind of that mindset and the, the shift that you went through. Yeah, I think I've been really privileged in my life in that um, I've never really had to worry too much about um, making ends meet. Like, I uh, I mean, my, my family were uh, are. are our poor immigrants and all, but we've never struggled to have food on the table or roof over our heads. I've never been homeless or anything like that. So yeah, while we didn't have like a luxurious lifestyle, it was, it, it was everything that we needed. And so throughout my engineering career, um, I kind of maintained that same mentality of not really spending lavishly. I just put money aside. So when the time came, um, you know, I was generating revenue through photography about, you know, 10 to $15,000 a year just from side um, side event, event photography, merit, weddings, um, a couple photo shoots here and there commissioned. Um, and I knew, I think I knew objectively that my work was fairly decent. Um, and that, you know, worst case I could just go back to shooting weddings and I could probably make a living. And, and I always had my family that would support me and, and, uh, I, I, you know, no, no wife, no kids, no house, no car, like none of these, like, um, things that really tie you down to, to, to make you re like think really hard about it. So I, I think I literally decided to quit my job within the span of a few weeks. It wasn't, it was just waking up one morning and realizing that it wasn't what I wanted to do. That engineering wasn't what I wanted to do in the, in the next 10 years. Um, and, uh, I think, I think what took me a little longer was to find out what to do with the extra time I was going to have. So I, the first thing I did was study for a GMAT. Um, so I basically built a plan C. So if engineering was plan B, then plan C would have been to go back to school. Um, and then after I finished that, I had some spare time and I just dove, you know, headfirst into photography and then it ended up working out. And so that's, you know, once again, became really became a photographer by default, not necessarily because I set out to do it, it just happened. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. Love hearing people's backstory. And, <laughs> and I guess next, let's transition to your growth as a photographer. Uh, you mentioned by default, but clearly I, you are a creative genius. You create epic fo photographs. How did that journey grow of just going from a photographer doing events to now truly one of the best photographers in the world doing things that most people can't even think of? How did that journey come? Well, yeah, so I, I, um, I have, I've had a few phases. I, uh, I think the first year was really focused on just learning my ropes around the camera, trying to figure out what things were. I think it took me six months to figure out what white balance was. Like, I just didn't know anything. I started from, from zero, joined a photography club. And then I got into event photography because it was the first time in my life that someone had offered to pay me to do something I wanted to do. 
And I thought that was pretty phenomenal. And right. so I dove into to event photography after my first paid gig, um, which was a referral from a friend. And I was like, oh, this is wonderful. And uh, that grew for about a year and a half um, to the point where, you know, I was, I was easily charging about $100, $100 an hour, $150 an hour. So it was going really well. Um, but at, at that point, I kind of realized that I had two jobs. I had engineering, my engineering job and my photography job, and that wasn't the one I had set out to do. So I just um, dropped the entire event photography business and decided to just focus on uh, doing fun, creative things since I already had a day job. And um, nice. I, kind of, I kind of kept that same mentality going forward even after I lost my day job that you know, photography to me was going to be something that I enjoyed doing. It was going to be um, my excuse for being able to travel, for being able to meet new people, for being able to try things that I would never do otherwise. And, and so that's, so photography became more of like a lifestyle than anything else. And, and so every so often, or fairly often, I guess you, uh, I, I find myself reconsidering the path that I've chosen in terms of like, why am I doing this? Is this where I want to be? Am I going in the right direction still? Is this still what I want? And, um, and that, that, that kind of constant questioning is something that I think helps to um, to nurture this growth. Um, so as far as like evolving into doing the crazy ethic stuff, um, I think I think I've because photography for me isn't just about capturing an image; it's about you know this entire new experience and and challenging myself to do something different and going going to do things that I've never done before. Uh, in essence, I think that translates very, very well into my work in that and I, I have like the attention span of like a goldfish. I, I just get <laughs> bored so fast that I'm always looking for something new, something exciting, something different and 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 trying to figure out how I can combine um, what I've learned in different unique, exciting combinations. Um, and so for for a while, I pursued this whole epic epic style of photography until I realized it was a little bit unscalable. There's only so epic you can go before it starts to become a little bit redundant um, and pointless along with um, it kind of lost its its challenge. And so most recently over the last uh, year or two, I've been really focused on trying to create work that is a lot more um, meaningful and impactful. So I've stumbled in on um, uh, environmental conservation or social impact work, which is where I'm currently playing around with. So I'm trying to bring you know, some refreshing creativity to a field that um, traditionally doesn't have that much of it. Um, and I think because it's a, a pretty hard topic to tackle. Yeah. And that, I, I think there's a lot that comes out of that, that statement that you just gave yeah. of constantly challenging yourself to be a creative and, and take on new things. And so that's a good segue into your current project that I know you're working on, which is 10,000 Bottles in a Mermaid, uh, which the yeah. third video in the series just launched today. Tell us a little bit more about that. Right. So, um, yeah, I've been I've been hunting for different ways to communicate environmental issues. It's been a year of uh, lots of failures, um, but along the way, there've been some successes. And and uh, this project, which features ten thousand plastic bottles and a mermaid, is actually, um, I think, my best project of the year. It's uh, probably the best project of my career. It's one that I'm really, really excited for, um, and. The genesis of the project was pretty haphazard. I, I mean, plastic pollution is a topic that I've been wanting to tackle, but didn't quite know how to um, attack it. Um, and so, oops, sorry. Let's wait, wait till the dogs start. <laughs> was it the mailman, Anna? <laughs> There's a whole, whole lot of excitement for a mailman. <laughs> All right, we're good again. Um, okay, so, um, so yeah, so I mean, plastic pollution is a topic that I've been really wanting to tackle, but I just didn't quite know how I was going to go about it. Sure. Um, and when my sis, when, when I went back to Montreal because my sister was getting married, um, she, uh, uh, she was trying to get her wedding dress fixed and the lady who was fixing her wedding dress that my mom had found happened to also make silicon mermaid tails and that's what really kickstarted the thought process where i was like oh you know like i've never really been that much into mermaids but when i saw her tails i was like oh these are really detailed there could be something here yeah um and then i connected that back to my plastic project and 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 then i had a conversation with one of my friends who who's trying to be a producer and and i was just saying you know it would be so cool if um 
if I had 10,000 plastic bottles, I think I could do something really cool. And he's like, oh, well, you know, why don't you let me look into that? And so within a couple of days, he, he found Tamara, who was going to lend us 10,000 plastic bottles. And then it was like, okay, well, now I need to find a warehouse. So some guy's wedding, which I had shot like six years back, um, happened to own a warehouse. I just reached out to see if he knew someone, and he happened to have one himself. And uh, then we had to find all the volunteers to clean the 10,000 plastic bottles and then place them and then, you know, model makeup, hair and all the rest of the stuff, which just becomes routine at that point. Um, and uh, and yeah, and so the, the project's been released in multiple parts. It's a new strategy that I'm trying. I figured that my videos over time went from being very photo centric, which were very educational to becoming more and more inspirational. And then mm -hmm. so along the way. I feel like photographers have maybe lost out a little bit more in the technical information because it's because it's something I've um, I found just less shareable to the general public. Um, so now I'm trying to release release in three parts where now the first two are extremely like one's about pre-production, one's yep. about shoot, and it really dives more into detail so that people can learn about it. And then this third one that's going to come out is very inspirational or aspirational, which talks about the motivations behind the project and summarizes the whole thing and hopefully makes it you know, newsworthy for Board Panda, Mashable, BuzzFeed, CNN, whatever, any one of those. Um, and so I'm just finishing the video. Um, I, I got my, I, I edited my first draft last night. Um, I went to bed at three in the morning and I'm um, going to need to put together the blog post, um, uh, sort out the press outreach and plan for the launch strategy that's going to happen this Monday. So um, I'm pretty excited about it because I don't, I, it, you know, it's it's one of those things where like I, I just feel like it really has potential to spread online. Yeah. But the truth is, you never know. Like these things, um, the, the internet does what the internet does. So you can only just do your best and hope. So we'll see. Um, I believe and, in uh, it. I, I watched the first two <laughs> two episodes, and they are definitely building up to to something. It's it's a great yeah. message. So when you put your passion. A great message together. I'm confident it'll do good things. So uh, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, at the very least, um, you know, uh, there's one person that likes it. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, that's that that's great. You know, it's really it's really hard to do things that um, when you when you think of like trying to drive social change, it's really hard to figure out how much is good enough because, you know, is it enough to change one life? No, but at the same time, is that one life worth more than anything else? Yes. So, Absolutely. you know, you, you, you kind of have this sort of a struggle. Um, so in that story, you mentioned, it sounded like you had an idea of something you wanted to do, but you didn't know how you wanted to do it. Then it was almost the mermaid tale that sparked it. So yep. take us through, I'm sure you have so many ideas that go through your mind. How do you start to crystallize which ones you're going to act on? And, and is it always just one little thing that gets it going? Take us through that from an idea to to reality. Right. So you, you mentioned a few times that that I'm <laughs> that, that that you think that I'm really creative. Um, I think that that's not necessarily the case. I don't think I'm actually more creative than the average person. Um, I think the biggest difference with me is that I'm more of a problem solver and I'm able to see how pieces will fit together. And so if I'm presented with enough leading points, I can kind of put them together and I'm very good at like getting people together and motivating them and, and, and making things happen. So the ideas don't inherently just like fall in, fall into my head. I feel like, okay. you know, everyone has ideas. They, they, they pass through them and more often than not, people discount their own ideas and never act on them. And so while there's a pretty huge percentage of concepts that never actually take place in my mind, they, they just kind of sit there and, um, and when I'm able to find the right connection, that's when I usually pursue it. So, you know, within my head, there's like a, a floating roster of different ideas that that kind of bubble up in importance or not based on my mood or the current topics or my time frame or whatever number of things. But whenever, um, um, but but when it comes time to actually crystallize them, um, that really only happens when I meet the right person. And so, you know, I'll. I'll I'll put a lot of time out there just so if you, you follow me on Facebook from yep. time to time, there'll be these really random status posts where yeah. I'm looking for something completely out of the blue. Um, and, and so, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes things turn up and most of the times things don't, um, actually the 10,000 plastic bottles, um, 
that was a post on Facebook. I made a post. I said, where can I find 10,000 plastic bottles? And that's when my friend who wanted to become a producer, which I didn't know at the time, left a comment and said, hey, let me help you. Let me help you. Why don't we chat and you can tell me what you're looking for. So you just like, like I like to put things out there and then sometimes yeah. they bite, sometimes it doesn't. And, um, and then along the way, I think my concepts are really built on the backbone of, is this something that people want to see? Um, I don't create for myself. I create for others. And, and the basic philosophy is that how things are shared in today's world is dependent on, on whether or not it can be summarized in a single sentence, right? Because otherwise no one's going to write about it if it can't create a headline. So, right. so you know, I, I think if I did, um, if I shot a, a, a model on plastic bottles, it would have been a lot less catchy than a mermaid with plastic bottles, for example. Yes. The, the number 10,000 when I, when I reached out wasn't that I had drawn a diagram and calculated the volume of bottles that I would need. It was because it was a catchy number. It would be, I mean, a hundred thousand would have been even better, but <laughs> you know, I asked for 10 and I got 10 and I was like, okay, great, let's do 10. So actually I think, I think the, the accurate number is that we had 12,000 plastic bottles, but 12 is not a good number. So, um, so I just say 10. Love so, it. so really it's, it's mostly about how you frame a problem and how you summarize a story. Um, and I think too often photographers are focused on creating a good image. Um, but you'll notice that creating a good, uh, like if you're a photographer, creating a good picture is the baseline. That's not like, that's not what you should aspire to, to do. You should, you should naturally be able to create, you, you should practice until you reach a point where you're good enough to create good images consistently. Yeah. And then where, where you stand out is in your ability to, um, create something unique, engaging, different, um, you know, what, whatever, whatever that thing is, um, because everyone can create good images today. So, and I, I've seen in places where you talked about the importance of the image is all the pre-production that happens. And the buildup to that is significantly more than the capture itself or the day of talk us through, you know, whether we use a 10,000 bottle example, or maybe another shoot that you've done, just how much in some cases goes into your pre-production. I, you know, there's a surprisingly large amount of time that I spend on Facebook and emails, just writing people back and forth and keeping conversations going. Um, I think I spend about 60 hours a week on a computer. Um, and so, and, and then out of those 60 hours, there may be about 30 minutes that's spent in Photoshop. So wow. um, the photography component of most of my stuff is very, very minimal. Um, the shoots themselves are fairly elaborate when they happen, but to lead up to actually having all the pieces of the puzzle to make them happen is pretty slow. And, and so I, I'm a very disorganized person. So like, you know, everyone has strengths and weaknesses. Um, one of my weaknesses, I'm really disorganized yet. I'm capable of doing these really elaborate shoots. And, and I think one of the reasons why that is, is because, um, I tend to constrain myself through travel. And so when I travel somewhere, I have a very limited amount of time to do something. And so there's this huge amount of pressure, you know, just like right before an exam, how you're like, you study the best, That's right. or you, That's right. you work on your paper the most efficiently right before the deadline happens. Cram it in. So it's kind of the same. Yeah. When I travel, I have this set deadline and within that frame, it's up to me for something to happen. And then, so I toss a whole bunch of things out in the universe. Some of them bounce back and then on occasion, something actually does work out and then boom, I have a project. Um, so, um, there, there's no like strict methodology because a lot of the, the times things fluctuate and change based on circumstances. Um, I mean, it's like shooting, doing a shoot underwater or doing a shoot up in the air. I'm, right now I'm trying to put a shoot together with um, another photographer here out in Australia where we're going to be shooting a, a paraplegic mother who, um, who became paraplegic after a routine surgery. And we're going to try to dangle her with a wheelchair from a cliff. Um, so it's like, you know, but but I mean, like today's Thursday. Our shoot was gonna be is is gonna be in one week, which is, um, yeah, next yeah. So our shoot's in a week, and we've just confirmed our model now. So, uh, you know, um, it, it's it's really funny because so many of these projects are really like by the skin of their teeth. Um, um, when I got the ten thousand plastic bottles, I didn't know how long it would take to clean them because I've never cleaned ten thousand plastic bottles. I didn't sure. know what type of patterns I was going to create. I didn't know what color bottles we were going to have. 
um, I didn't know what things would look like because I'd never played with these things before. So, you know, it's just a question of solving problems, um, being picky enough to, to know when you need to keep trying and fixing things and being flexible enough to adapt when things don't go as planned and, and to, um, come up with creative, creative ways. For example, um, even in the plastic bottle shoot where we had to figure out how to suspend the camera from above, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm not an engineeringly savvy person despite having a degree in engineering. Um, but, but I found someone who knew better. And so he recommended a pulley system, right? So yep. these are, these are kind of like part of that problem solving process. But you know, if, if I hadn't found that guy, we could have gone with a C stand. We could have figured out how to borrow a, per- a cherry picker. We could have maybe shot it from a really tall ladder or maybe just taken two ladders and then sat in the middle of it. You know, like there's like so many different like iterations of thought processes that can happen. Um, but it's just being able to work through those and coming up with the best one with the constraints that you have available. So I just look at it as all as one big problem to solve. I love it. Yep. And as you <laughs> solve the problem, that's where the, the genius comes right. out. But you'll notice that none of this has anything to do with photography. Um, exactly. the, the photography is a part you're supposed to know inside and out. Um, you're supposed to know your shutter speed aperture, um, you know, composition, how, how that works with your flashes what you're good at, what you're not good at, and what you can fix in post, what you can't fix in post. Um, you know, what your style is, what your brand is. Um, all, all this stuff is like those, I think in order to start creating things that are really unique, you need to start by mastering the basics. Um, and that shouldn't take more than a year or two if you really put your back into it. Um, at least that's, that's, that's how I feel. No, it's good. So what you're saying is, yeah, just the art of a good image is the ticket to play. It's the the rest of the pieces that can really make it stand out, which is obviously where you excel. Yeah, well, but that's that's my personal style. I mean, I know I know people who do great things with nothing, where you know they can just show up on the streets and come up with great images, or just use birthday sparkler or or, or steam coming out of their breath or whatever. But like, yep. then their skill set lies in maybe spending all their time discovering these moments or landscape photographers who spend all their time finding the most exotic places or waiting for the right light. Yes. Once again, it's not about the photography. It's about them going out above and beyond to get what they need to get and not figuring out how to use a camera that, that, that should be really, that should be in the back of, that should be sorted like far, far, far along. It. So good. So good. Great advice, Ben. Thank you. Um, cool. something I have, a vision for in my mind to maybe tie it together and this, I'm a few sure. months away from being able to do it but you're wearing a shirt that says smug mug I saw on your site where you did a shoot for smug mug where you made their employees yeah. look like phenomenal athletes so I had an idea where I want to try to recreate something similar but with my kids I love taking pictures mm-hmm. of my kids so I can't do it right now because it's winter here in in Texas unlike there in Australia where I'm sure it's summertime but yeah. I want to try to recreate something where I get the kids out and I try to make them look super athletic and all that and have fun with it. So this summer I've challenged myself to try to recreate in a similar fashion what you did for Smug Mug. So that's just a way for me to put it out there, kind of challenge myself and, and try to do something. Very fun. cool. So, well, I'm glad like, like that's why I do these videos, man. Like I, I really, it, it's great to hear that, you know, you saw, you saw something, you came up with an idea, you're remixing it to your own style and, and, and doing something that you love. I mean, that's really what it's about, right? You are truly inspiring. So I just thought I'd share that with you. It's it's all for fun on okay. my side. Great. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. Maybe I'll, I'll send an image awesome, to you and see, see what you think. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I'd love to see. Great. Can't wait. Ben, best of luck with the, the 10,000 bottles and a mermaid. It's a great message with your passion. Yeah. I'm confident that uh, you know it'll do good things. So. Um, Thank you so much, Ben, for taking time with us. I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing what you have in store in the future. All right. Fingers crossed. Thanks, man.